Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the Lasses of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Yanis Mandrixlover. And right now, uh, we need to talk about the Council's response, the Council's factions, and pettiness have managed to drag a debate on fundamental issues to a grinding halt. Military, economic, and diplomatic issues are deadlocked by disagreements between hardliners and sympathizers. Rural and urban delegates in the Euro League struggle to keep a consensus which never existed outside their notepads. The meeting appears to be, like so many other impossible hopes, a stillbirth. Then alone, commune delegate splits himself off from the fray and marches to the podium. In a desperate, heartfelt plea, he reminds his brothers of the presence of hungry things in the dark, Dovanga and Lysenko, and beyond them, horrifying stories seeping in about what is left of Aldina. Armies using human waves, power struggles, and tin pot tyranny. Against such things, he tells them, there's no cure but unity and brotherhood. The spirit of liberty cannot be allowed to perish on the altar of purity, he cries, glaring at his own delegation for an uncomfortable minute. Then he proposes a similar program. Mendrix will visit the communes on a goodwill tour, and naturally both sides will respond as a show of goodwill. Military advisors will be sent on both sides to ensure security, economic support, and will be forthcoming to be used at the council's discretion, and nearly bilateral talks will ensure this relationship continues to develop at an even pace. The assembly listens, thinking. Slowly, the debate shifts to a practical solutions and then schedule planning. Against all odds, the delegates have ensured the meeting success. Freedom in the Urals draws another beautiful, impossible breath. I honestly can't believe that worked. And with cat-like threads... With miles of lands, a patrol, and few men to do it, the Euro League prioritizes or prizes mobility. Part of every guard's training is the use of all kinds of transportation for the smallest motorcycle, horses and trucks, the largest armored vehicles. Our guards will learn to use every means of transport available, how to give them proper care, and the role they can play on the battlefield. Not every situation calls for automobiles, so our guards will change extensively in movement by foot. Drawing on the experience of the long march from the Volkutlag through the war-torn Russian hinterland, at the end of their training program, the recruits will have to conduct a fully equipped 150 miles march through the Russian woods, nicknamed the De March of Death. It owes its name to the reality that a soldier would probably be killed by bandits, animals, or weather. If he lags behind, he can't keep up with his platoon. Now, I might have read that earlier, so I apologize, but I'll be honest, I can't remember the ta last time I actually recorded the video, between this video and the last, so my apologies. Um, Army XP, eh, logistics, not bad. We can use more. Every resource possible sounds pretty darn good, so let's do that one next. Despite the uncontested superiority of our men on the battlefield, the League does not possess enough resources and equipment to face both Lervango's bandit horde and Lysenko's chickens. Abandoning the people of the Euro Mountains is not an option, so we'll use our ingenuity to produce the material necessary to enter foes. Local Euralian gunsmiths already produce a variety of small arms, and though they are of inferior quality, beggars can't be choosers. Commandant Staranov is an enthusiast of improvised explosives of all kinds, from the smaller bombs used by our saboteurs to blow up enemy ammo depots, to mines made from fuel barrels that can wipe out an entire enemy platoon when some poor dude steps on one. Other creative proposals are handmade suppressors for our commander units and crude artillery pieces for using metal pipes and gas cylinders. And I apologize, I know I read that one before as, as well, but yeah, my bad. A welcome invitation. Word has finally come back from Orenburg and its surrounding settlements. Our proposal to hold bilateral talks to deepen our growing relationship has finally been accepted. This decision probably requires a tremendous effort from the more reasonable members of the council, but what matters is the result. This greatly welcomed invitation to meet with many of the representatives of Orenburg, a rare treat for outsiders of the communes to receive, has opened a great host of opportunities for us to now make best use of an advancing or for advancing our interests. Mandrix was reported to have visited the old chapel of his fortress immediately after hearing the, the welcome news, having offered prayers, not only for the safety of his beloved guards and beleaguered Orenburg, but also for the friendship that was being fostered between the two. In a time of darkness, hopelessness, and fear, this little event, so insignificant outside of the small region of Russia, has given the people of the southern Urals a significantly more realistic expectation of a better future, if not for themselves, then for the children. Praise be to God, and we can use more. The recruits of Colonel Ilya Steranov's first training class have proved in their worth, and combat numerous times, however. Their harsh training process has declared downside. Only a small amount of men are strong and capable enough to claw through the whole training process and receive their place in the Ural Guard. Placing dual threats from the south and east. The Euro Guard desperately needs not only quantity, but quality. Through the core that Starnoff has raised is exceptional, though it is. They can only do so much alone, though it likely pains the old tough colonel. Our recruitment must be expanded. Let us gather the masses into our army. Then Starnoff can wheel them out as he sees fit. Increase the size of a training program and lowering training speed. That's fine. The council invites us to visit. Mendrix came out of the oak side door, greeted by a tremendous dim, uh, din of a sea of voices, before even seeing the countless faces of the many people he was about to speak with. As he entered the large hall, he felt the, uh, the slight discomfort associated with having an untold number of eyes focused on you. All heads were turned towards him, and all conversation had died with frightful speed, except for a few slight whispers. The room was eerily silent. The slender priest tightly gripped the small wooden cross he always held deep in his pocket, after all. Even great men may feel insecure and require the comfort of their loved ones, and yet then began to speak with his eloquent, articulate, yet somber tone. First, he asked for a representative to accept the gift he had brought from the guards. After a brief murmur among the council members, a muscular bearded man, likely a farmer or manual worker judging by the calluses on his hand, reached out to introduce himself to Mendrix. Surprisingly, the man pulled a beautifully woven winter coat from his chair and entrusted it to a priest, uttering what most probably were practiced lines, but the gift was a showing of Orenburg's spirit. Yes, 
This was not seemingly an unfriendly gesture, and the priest was almost amused to see the burly man nervously fidgeting, waiting for his reaction with a large, friendly smile. Mendrix returned the pleasant gesture with his own gifts and an adored knife, a symbol of the strong yet protective nature of the Euro Guard. Deep down in his thoughts, he always felt the glimmer of inspiration for an address, much like a sermon as he observed the stark contrast between the two gifts and what they represented. This was likely going to be a very successful meeting. Brothers and sisters, there shall be peace. Eventually. Eventually. We can still train the militias, but... I think we're kind of okay. The fourth batch returns, though. All squad leader Fyodor Mikhailovich could hear was a crump, crump, crump of explosives, or explosions all around him, and a tightening noose of thunder and light. Screams echoed in the wilderness, um, in the middle, oh, in the wilderness of the night. Unanswered prayers and profanities mingling in the hush, and no one could have seen this coming, not even not a man in the people's training militia, or the early, but here it was in the chaos, his hot beats. Oh, well, my bad. Sword into lifetimes. The plan had been simple at first. Secure the objective Anton at dawn and Boris and Vasily by evening. No one had expected what appeared to be an ambush prepared by bandits for the convoy. The instructors had been the first to die in the chaos, pinwheeled into smears of blood in the grasses. Now the remainder of the platoon was pinned in a grotesque version of their own training exercise, with low supplies, low ammo, and mounting casualties. Ten soldiers towards the furnace. Fyodor looked at Grigory, then Mikhail both firing sporadically in the darkness beside him. He promised to get them home, and he was, after all, a squad leader. A roll of the die in his head, and it was settled. Shame had, shame had to be this way. Now he yelled with all the strength he had to him. All squads execute rear movement and prepare for breakout. Shadows in his foul jerked to life, shuddering with effort under the fear and stress. One by one they moved to the rear, and the strains of fire swelled to a climax behind him. But he stayed. Two grenades, three magazines emptied. Keep your men safe to the last second. Body after body jerked and fell. Too little, too slow. He drew grenades, slumped over. Time stretched to an infinity. One hustle, two hustles, three. Pull the pin. One, two, three, four. Then, naming days came for the battalion. They voted for Fyodor. It was the only unanimous vote the battalion ever had. Dolce et decorum est pro fratra, fratria mori. Oh boy. Oh boy. But you gotta do what you gotta do, hearts and stomachs. Recruitment had been difficult in Orenburg. While the Guard has attempted to replenish its numbers with volunteers from those as it protects, as it always have, many of the columns of Orenburg are in dire straits. Even if they put on a proud face, and no matter how rich the city of Orenburg itself is, destitution affects the land like a cancer. This was more evident than everyone's senior lieutenant Kolbayakov and his squad arrived in Krasny Mayak, a village without so much as a sign to distinguish it from the mud that it covered, or it covered it. When they arrived at the village, the officer did as he had always had done. He mounted a stool and began re regaling the villagers with tales of the guards' bravery and of their noble mission. He spoke at length of the long march from Vorkuta, of the many dangers they had faced along the way and of numerous victories, the destruction of the Basagi Black Brigades, their triumphant or the triumph against a pack of over a hundred wolves in Svidlosk that had been prepared to overrun the village of Berdiagunia. Even his own escape from the cannibalistic cult of the Stone Mountain. Yet, he was not halfway through a regaling, a regaling, a regaling reconstruction of the Battle of the Susva, 77, when the villagers interrupted. Jeering shouts destroyed what little hope the comrade lieutenant had of, of, any finding, of finding any suitable recruits, as the villagers demanded not tales of heroism, but food, water, and warm clothes. If you wish to protect us, and feed us, came one angered voice. I cannot clothe my children, and you ask me to fight? Came another. After several minutes, the guardsmen dejectedly began handing villagers their rations, or their coats, or anything else they had on their person. Soldier Yudin gave his coat. Junior Sergeant Ipatov turned in his cigarettes, and Ivanov was pressured for his watch. But at the end of the day, the guard left Krasny Mayak without a single recruit, and far poorer than they had arrived. Can we truly help those who cannot help themselves? Stand for the League. I, I definitely want to get that one. That's not bad. Uh, to upgrade our Euro Guard. Ooh. What happens if we go this way first? Let's stand for the League. Colonel Saranov's first class of trainees had just completed their training, finishing the March of Death and heading to the Euro League headquarters. Here, they would receive the coveted beret, red berets, representing their worth as a full member of the Euro Guard. Their old troops stood in formation in the courtyard as the lieutenant had uh, finished or issued a head count. Saranov was pleased. Not a single trainee had perished during the March of Death, a testament to how his brutal training methods had hardened their bodies and minds after the commander inspected them. The soldiers were ordered to kneel on the ground. Father Yanis Mendrix, the Euro League, uh, Euro League's leader himself, had come forward and looked into the, every recruit's eyes and led them in saying their vows in the name of God. I will stand by the League and give my life to protect Russia. My comrades and the innocent, as he gave each soldier the new beret. They stood, through their bodies ached and their stomachs growled. They wore each... Each wore an expression of pride. They were truly Russia's finest and a decision for our commanders. As the wolves began to claw at the door, our commanders have once again gathered in the council. In the face of such dangers, we have to make tough decisions about our national defense, as we can't give every program focus. We have a choice. A few choices, to say. The first is updating our equipment. Many of our troops are currently using weapons that are decades old. 
Uh, dating back to the Great Patriotic War, a German car 98 care of old Soviet PPSH-41 are commonly seen resting on the shoulders of a guard's detention. The soldiers struggle to maintain the crumbling weapons, and they stand no chance against the assault rifles of Lysenko or the motorcycles of Dovanga. Incentivizing a native arms industry and outfitting our troops with new weapons is well, well, quite costly, however. We will sacrifice civilian industrial capacity, but it may be worth it. A second option presented to us is to conscript the strongest refugees to construct forts along the border with our southern and eastern neighbors again. We will sacrifice the industrial capability that we desperately need, but national defense is a top priority. And a poor economy is better than an economy ruled by the single Dovanga. The third and final option is to send the refugees to work in local factories. We are short of funds, and we can't maintain a war economy forever. Safety is key. Ooh. Ooh, I don't know about that. We already... We barely have one. Add a production? What does that mean? We won't sacrifice civilian quality of life for a minor increase in war capacity, honestly. What do you mean by a production of infantry equipment? Like, you get one more factory? I don't understand. I'm not going to sacrifice it. Stand for the League, of course, is up next, which is nice. And we'll get through this stuff. I do want to accept no substitutes to get that one. Learn from the best is not bad. Russia's finest. I'll wait for that one just because we've got, hopefully, a little bit of time. Uh, Dovanga and Lysenko seem to be pretty thick right now. And we're going to get a lot of this stuff here, too. So, increase the number of initiates. I mean, we're at 780 already. Like, that's that's pretty darn good. So, that's weird. Is there... Oh, they're raiding each other. Look at that. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Oh. Oh. Can we actually raid these guys? Initiate a counter raid? I don't think we're strong enough to. But what if we attacked them immediately? Would that be... Oh, in 15 days. Okay. We can use more. Well, maybe that was a big old mistake. And if we don't do well, then you won't see that, maybe. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah, they're coming back. My bad. Um... Was he? Oh well. Yeah, it's good to see what what happened. Understand supreme excellence. An old military manual once said that to fight and conquer in all our battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence is breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. This maxim holds is especially pertinent regarding the current situation in the Euro Guards. With limited resources and manpower and threatened by two ruthless and larger foes, devising ways to cripple our enemy without risking our lives is a must. Various methods have been studied by our field commanders to cripple our enemies in both the NKVD and the SS bands with minimal effort. Among these proposals are creating raider bands to attack the enemy as they sleep, precise mortar strength of their ammo caches to leave them defenseless, sending false info over the enemy's radio to break their cohesion. Sending commander groups dressed like the enemy to sow so terror behind their lines, and even more exotic ideas like disguising one of our garrisons as a training caravan to lure the enemy into an ambush. Oh, crap. Well, now I regret doing this. Um. Can we actually win there? Oh, are we actually winning? You got one heck of a weird head. Okay, I'm feeling a lot. We have received an ultimatum from Sibay. They're demanding that we hand over a tribute to looters or else raid us and take it away from us. Impasse to decide. Uh, okay then. We are actually very successful there. Surprisingly, very successful. Holy crap. Okay. Maybe we'll do that again. And we can't build anything here, but we can resettle more refugees. That'd be pretty good for us. It's not like we can build anything. When is this going to get done? In 21, 20, 91? 21, 90, holy crap. Uh, yeah, we're not doing great on this stuff here, but still. Hostile weather conditioning? The climate of the Euro Mountains is one of the harshest on the planet. The hot summer days make men collapse from heat stroke, and the cold winter nights kill anything that is unlucky enough to spend some hours outdoors without adequate shelter in the high altitudes of the tall mountains can make an untrained man faint from lack of air just after a short sprint. It's necessary that a guard is accustomed to living in such weather. It is to be expected to take couch seats from enemy fire, but to lose good men from camping in the snow is unacceptable. Our, guard will, our guards will be subject to a harsh training regimen. A regime, ministered by the rough survivalists, usually living off the land of the Urals, so our men will be toughened against even the roughest weather. Through sweltering marches and the summer and long marches and watches through this chilling night, our guard will be made ready for anything. A sweet farewell. The marshal draws another bit of uh, ragged breath. Fenty aides jostle around him in the sick bay, and the air is rank with nerves and chatter of the wounded. The face of the guard's crewman effort lies ashen in a bed, half dead with illness, and the prognosis is less than optimal, but the, that's the furthest thing on his mind right now as he struggles forward, hacking all the way to the sitting position. He was a disciplined soldier to the core, there was a briefing to attend to, and he would not miss it even unto death. The gasps reached him before the man himself. People shuffled aside and half bowed the presence of the leader of the Euro League himself. Mendrix walks to him, and the marshal struggles to offer a salute. Come now, marshal, there's no need for theatrics. At ease among friends, remember? 
The marshal falls back, his face lined with exhaustion. He struggles to frame the words in his mind. Are my men, men doing fine? How are the volunteer brigades? And Mandrick smiles, his face momentarily younger by decades. Floodgates of stress lifting for a brief moment, and the marshal is thrown back to the Vorkuta, face to face with an idealistic Latvian priest too darned stubborn to die. Too upright, and nothing not to follow. I'm proud of you because of your work. We have something resembling a proper army, and the arms and supplies flowing from the communes to support it. Listen to me. I've talked with their staff, and they think we might stand a chance against the bandits in the Black Mountain. That's what you're giving us. A fighting chance to build a future that's ours. The people here are in your debt, and so am I. That's all, soldier. Us now, may God go with you. The marshal smiles and closes his eyes. It's the first time he smiled in a long while until he joins Yulia again. The marshal, the bearer of the Ural Guard, is at rest, and his work is finished. Stand down, old soldier. We'll take it from here. Oh, boy. But accept no substitutes. Some people say that in times of conflict they would rise to the occasion. Often they never do. They panic when they see their friends being torn to shreds by enemy fire. The only way to make them effective soldiers is to push them to, to break physically, mentally. They never build them as warriors indifferent to the horrors of war. They will be made into men who can wield weapons with ease and who are weapons themselves. The children of Rokuta and few men strong enough to pass through Ilya, Staranov's ruthless training methods have proven their worth as warriors. They usually cannot accept substitutes. Pairing weak and untrained men with an experienced squad will break the unit's cohesion and pose a threat or risk to both themselves and... They're comrades. Is this us trying to get all this uh, research speed good and worthwhile? Probably not, honestly. But whatever. Whatever. It's not bad for arming speed, not gonna lie. Not too bad. So did we actually have that earlier? No, it's still 2191 probably, right? No, 1982. So it was only 20 more years. Okay. Only 20 more years, everybody. Nice. Accept no substitutes. Alright, so now after that one, let's do this one too, because we can still use this one pretty quickly. The children of Vokuto are the most valiant fighting force in all of Russia, all them veterans of the Patriotic War, survivors of the harsh conditions of the Vokutilag. Some of them are both, having spent months wandering through the motherland in the long march south, withstanding bandits, landmines, animals, warlords, and the cold itself. The children are as tough and resilient as they come. Although Nurukus proved their worth by passing the grueling training methods of Ilya Sternov, not everything can be proven in the training camp. Our veteran guards should be paired with eager recruits who have just received their beret and teach them useful skills that they can only be learned from experience. Oh, and the game is lagging super hard because of a small thing called a German Civil War. That's all. Nice. And soon enough we'll have Africa going kaboom too. And that's okay with us. Commandeer training equipment. Sure why we'd want to do that right now. More army XP. The bombing stuff. You don't worry about that, please go ahead. Clear skies, dark clouds, new focus tree, maybe? Probably not, but hopefully not. Yeah, we're doing relatively okay-ish. That is some pretty harsh lag. Anything else here? Ooh, stand for the league, yes please. Oh, there goes Himmler too. Ah, beautiful. Ah, since we're here, then they shall know no fear. The Euro Guard. Uh, no brawler stronger than us. No sharpshooter more accurate, no faster, no tactician smarter, no animal more ferocious. We are the soldiers of the Euro Guard. We've had our skin hardened by working on the gulags of Okuta and turned into steel by Colonel Ilya Sternov's grueling uh, training methods. Now our will can only be stopped by death. We are proud to be men who face death and meet our soldiers end in battle. We are the sentinels of the Euros and the world's best fighting force. Men who love peace but are not afraid of war, and despite our fewer numbers, we will face Dovang as a band of invading thugs head on, with our arms in hand and our flags unfolded, unfolded as only one guard is worth more than the whole SS. A more organization, slightly more organization, recovery, acclimatization, line of true defense, not bad. You know, just in case. If they want to raid us again, not bad. A oh, perfecting the guard, look at this. Oh, yeah! Heck yeah. Counter raids. The Battle of Novotroitsk. Industry of people. Kodaisis, one of our commanders, has sent a radio message to inform us that Dovanga's brigade has launched an all out attack on the town of Novotroitsk. Wait, what? Uh, the town's been under our protection for a while now and serves a crucial role in a war machine due to its mineral rich resources. As such, we installed a Euro Guard garrison there to protect the town from any attack or raid. This, however, is no order any raid, with the commander uh, reporting our outer positions have already been overrun, deeper pushes into our town expected. There are two key parts of the battle we, or town we control the town center and the industrial district, and the commander needs to know which one he should prioritize. Uh, if we order the guard garrison to focus on defense of the town center, we might be able to hold back Drovanga's forces long enough to evacuate the civilians and the wounded, reducing losses and keeping the people's faith in us. But we'd be allowing those dudes to raid our industrial plants for supplies and materials. If we're able to focus our main defense on the industrial district instead, we should be able to hold back the enemy long enough to deflect heavy damage to the industry to prevent it falling into Drovanga's hands. But we would take heavier losses and leave the civilians unprotected with obvious consequences, which we do. Oh, getting another military factory is super important. Oh, yeah. Do we actually get that, though? But we were defeated. 
Spare you all a moment to more than the people of Novosibirsk, just as we fear a garrison in Novotroitsk have been utterly crushed by Dravanga's brigade, despite a valiant effort to defend the town. Reports are already coming in of the horrendous atrocities being inflicted upon the civilian population we were unable to evacuate, along with mass lootings and destruction inflicted upon the town. Not only have we have lost our the industrial capacity of Novotroitsk, but the people will shake the faith that the people had in us and put our put in our ability to protect them. We made it to promise now that as the news of the battle spread, everyone know that we have broken it. Crushing but what the heck? That's stupid. Okay, so yeah, these, like Orenburg, I think, Dorovengel's Brigade, Magnitogorsk, they're not done yet. They're definitely not done in terms of uh, content. Because uh, it shows that they're definitely not. Like, this, this feels a, a little rushed, but we drop further. Shuffle the veterans. Our common interests. Speak with Burba. Many helping hands. That's not bad. No one fights alone, and every guard deployed to the front lines can only perform at peak effectiveness when it's supported by numerous others in assistant roles in both combat and support positions. The mortar, the heavy machine gun, and anti-tank teams as well as nurses, radio operators, construction workers, mechanics, drivers, and other support personnel are essential for the functioning of our forces. These positions could easily be staffed by the recently trained militia members by giving them valuable combat experience with lower risks than a rifleman, while freeing up the more experienced guards to conduct more dangerous missions on the front lines. Unfortunately, we're all out of coffee. Like, if they're raiding us, we're getting actual combat here. Rush is finest. The heroes are not a place for the weak or cowardly. The craggy mountains serve as icy graves interspattered with bandits and robber, and robber cities. Both guns and guts are needed to survive in this hellish landscape, and our troops have both. The ideal hero soldier would have a hardy weapon in hand, one which would not jam or falter. He would know the heroes like the back of his hand and be adept with the map and compass. Most importantly, his belief in the cause is so resolute that he would sacrifice himself for the dream of the Euro League. Freedom in the face of evil, independence in the face of the overwhelming mob, and unselfishness in the face of greed. Never will the men of the Euro League surrender in the face of danger, dying with gun and grenade in hand before giving the enemy the pleasure of holding one of ours in the grasp. The Euro League was born out of desperation and blood in the frozen gulags of Orkuta, and proved the worth in the long march throughout through the Rodina. Now the guard is a die, it will die as a union. By fire, not by descent. The guard may die, but it will never surrender. Not bad. 780 is still not bad. Uh, we're not going to commandeer anything. Not yet. No, no, no. I'm going to go reach out further. A paying job is not bad. I don't know how far... Let's see how far we go with this stuff. Let's shuffle the veterans. The training regime imposed on the militias have turned a score of weak and undisciplined refugees into cohesive fighting units capable of holding the line against the most vile enemies. But training can only go so far as their skills only experience can teach. To better to prepare militiamen, a program shall be devised embedded to embed our most experienced guards into the militia command structure for the limited periods of time and rotate them through different militia units, teaching the recruits valuable experience and preventing them from making dangerous missions or mistakes while in combat. The rotation system will improve the recruit training experience by dividing the veterans into three groups, one fighting in the front, one training in the militia, and a third enjoying their well-earned rest so they can return fresh to duty. Might as well. Sm sounds smart. So we only... Okay, so we got the third one too. So we're actually making some anti-tank. Look at that. Not bad. Nice. Oh, anything else here different? Oh, perfecting the guard. Heck yeah, more organization. Oh, slightly more population too. Oh, yes, please. Reaching out further. The results of the first class of the leader of militia recruits trained by our instructors was a very pleasant surprise, even for the most skeptical. The first few days were hectic as we prepped their minds for war, but after weeks of training, every recruit became an expert after looking for danger from the trees and on the ground, and responded with fire when they heard a rifle sound. Or rifle round. These men all have the same prior, albeit largely limited combat experience, being formerly either in the Red Army or some village militia. Yet the astonishing success of the training methods convinced instructors to cast a wider net. Now the criteria to join the Euro Guard does not deepen on the recruit's prior experience, but on his toughness to march through the immense forests and snowy plains of Russia, on his willingness to, and when the fires of the war come, lay down their lives for their land. New recruits from all walks of life will now be called up for a second training class. All right, second training class, let's go. So how do we raid these guys again? I want to raid them again. I want to beat the crap out of them. Dovanga, they only have a thousand manpower. They just have none. I'm feeling not too bad about this now. I'm mean, rot still, but still. I mean, this is tough as not, it's not bad. I mean, we, we need the war sport. Um, I don't want to get more GDP cost, but like, ooh, that's not bad either. Ooh, that's pretty good too. Um, so we'll probably I'll do some more stuff with Orenburg though. Yeah, getting more stuff with Orenburg would be very good. Speak with Burba. Two men have proven themselves able enough to see the need for a more centralized Orenburg community system. More capable of weathering the storm of foreign invasion, however, their methods of achieving this security are vastly different, which has led us to support the industrious Alexander Burba over the ineffectual communist Gregory Melenkov. If Melenkov were able to assert prerogative over the council, he may try to halt any negotiations with us, as informants have made us aware that he was hostile to what he perceives as a foreign power exerting influence over Orenburg. Burba, therefore, is our man. 
The technocrat has already been proven capable of transforming Orenburg into the city it is today after the fall of the USSR. With this focus on industrializing and centralizing the economies further, we can be sure that he will be capable of protecting the Orenburg region. Offering its support purpose reforms could go a long way towards strengthening the defense of the, uh, the Southern Euros. I almost said Civil War, English Civil War. Oh boy. I could get more guys, but I don't want to spend the PP for it. And I do anyways, why not? Who cares? The wandering shepherd expanding our standards. The role of the guards to defend the cities of the League. A citizens of the League. Without vast numbers, our limited troops simply cannot meet the manpower our borders demand. Encouraged by the tremendous success of the military program, which turned hopeless civilians and refugees into competent soldiers, the League's high command is therefore voted to decrease the military standards, going so far to recruit women to the ranks. This is done in the hopes that all willing recruits, regardless of previous training, can do their part in the defense of the League. While generals like Starnoff support a highly trained army of elites, in which only the best are accepted, it's not enough to fulfill our needs. Anyone who has a will to defend our land is fit in the army of the Urals. We will not bow to attacks. Heck no. Only it maxed out at 800. That sucks. Uh, but, ooh, look at that. Killing each other. Today's service is quiet, as it usually is, even before the Union's collapse and the chaos of the warlords. Catholicism has always been alien to Orthodox Russia. So it's no wonder that the chapel tucked in the corner of Ustkatov is rarely visited and has never been filled. The priest stands before the consecrated host and offers prayers for the lost souls who are sufficiently beaten down to seek refuge in God. Suddenly a gaunt figure dressed in gray robes is say shaded by the dim candlelight and a hood over his hair walks into the church straight to the altar. He clasps his hands inside a prayer for a moment and takes a seat. The priest is confused but takes it in stride. He has seen all manner of confusion in his time and anxiety never served a man of God well. As communion is served, the weak priest walks through the empty pews, serving wine and bread like his predecessors, a line of servants stretching to the time of Peter. He notices the man praying and asks his name and if he can pray, help pray for him. The man looks up his eyes liquid. Forgive me, Father, he whispers in a voice hoarse, or hoarse with relief and or ugh, hoarse with grief. For I have strayed away from my duty and sit on a broken throne. I am for peace, but those around me call for war. My heart is troubled and I sorrow unto death. I am, was a servant, a priest. I have abandoned my duty to the living God. Who will forgive me? Who can? The priest confused stares at him after all, hearing a confession imperfect, if accident, a lot is unique happening in these beleaguered lands. And something about him seems familiar. Could it be? The man stops himself, pulls his robes together and stands up. He paces out of the church, leaving a priest on whom on the truth is slowly dawning and behind. And like Peter before him, the denier of his Christ, Janus Mendrix flees into the night, leaving only a tear-stained eye to show he was ever there. For our iniquities, he was abandoned. Watch the troops. Oh, look at this. Oh, we lose quite a bit more political power, which I don't like. We, don't, we already don't get... Well, actually, we get a good amount, but, you know, after we watch it, our common interests. In this barren, bombed wasteland we call our home, we have met fellow survivors with similar desires and goals, a desire to live in the Southern Euros, and to split a peace and prosperity. Our methods of working towards our vision of utopia may be wildly different, but if we can manage to unite on the ends, the means just become a few conversations away from being accepted by both parties. Our delegates to the Orenburg Council will come back, speaking highly of the moral grounds on which the communes are built. Our representatives believe that they have the capability of transforming the region for the better, and to help alleviate the pain and suffering of the region. The Council, by and large, supports our motives, praising our tenacity in hunting down dangerous criminals and protecting the rights and freedoms of individuals from oppression. It seems our two paths are converging towards a better future for the Urals, and our common interests and unite us, and our unity shall lift us both. So we're done with that. Finally, we're going to start doing some other stuff here. Make sure artillery is actually pretty decent. I mean, our divisions... They're not great. I mean, it requires even more... Actually, that's not bad. Um... Yeah. Making our divisions just bigger and stronger. Probably not a bad idea, but still. Perfecting the guard. Uh, let's see. More organization, recruitable population. Yes, please. Yes, Saya. I wish we could recruit even more. I don't want to go any higher than that, though, right now. So, uh, Do we have any support equipment? I don't think we do, do we? No, we do not. That's Sakarino. Speak with Bubba. Eyes on the border. I don't want to train too because we're out of guns, but train anyways because you can. Burba, 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 burba. That's already April, huh? Oh, win, Hadrish, win, 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 win. I hope, I hope Hadrish wins. Burba announces his bid for Lord Ornberg leadership. Major events are taking place in the free and prosperous city of Orenburg. Alexander Burb, a brilliant engineer and most influential industrialist in the city he helped to reconstruct after it was left alone in the wake of the Soviet downfall, has decided to take the political matters of the region in his hands and launch his leadership bid as a chairman of the Workers' Council of Orenburg. For us, the rise of Burb to the top could have been the most positive consequence for the future of our relationship with the anarchists. Though Burb has not made any statements about a cause, we can find common ground in our mutual desire to end political chaos and confusion in the city and organize a strong centralized army for the communes, however. As much as our encouragement means... Uh, for in his pursuit of a strong and assertive Orenburg, our vocal support for Burba could potentially harm his bid for leadership. 
Those who are the League with suspicion and fear are influenced by view Burba as a puppet. We should proceed cautiously if we want Burba to emerge as a strong leader needed for Orenburg in these dire times. Hmm. We'll go that direction because we can. Even if we don't get him, like I think we'll still do okay-ish. Uh, more manpower, why not? We love those men. Burba doesn't need anyone's help. Crap. We received a message from Alex Alexander Burba stating he doesn't want our help. He will alone take the reins of power and lead Orenburg to greatness. After all, he stated, him. He rose from the bottom by his strength alone to reach a position he now holds. To be frank, we are not sure why he asked for help in the first place, only to then reject it. When they said he was a character, they weren't lying, that's for sure. What a waste of time. Another failed democracy. Ah, I gotta love it. Watch our troops. Well. Ooh, that's not bad. Get more logistics. Hunters and trappers. I do want to keep going this way and see what happens, maybe. So, ooh. The train co -op. Train with those guys? Oh, uh, that's not bad. I mean, GDP won't really matter. But kidding, that was so good, though. Stand for something greater. Mm, a paying job. We get more stability, too, which is not bad. Yeah, I got a lot more stability, actually. Life in Russia is uncertain in the hectic years following the German invasion. All that resembled order and stability came crumbling down into the terror of the Luftwaffe. Farms were burned, stores looted, factories destroyed, and irrigation systems bombed. Countless Russian men were left out of a home and a job and in a neighborhood. Left around the countryside doing whatever it took to survive. Though a great number of these men have turned to banditry, most of them survived on the basis of odd jobs and manual labor. These masses, masses of unemployed and hopeless men will be willing to enlist in the Euro Guard if offered steady employment with salaries good enough to feed the families. This couple with a coherent pay scale and the opportunity for promotions will encourage them to enlist for a longer period. Nice. I just want to raid him again, man. Comfortable barracks. Homelessness is the constant in the lives of most Russians following the German invasion. The ruthless attempt by the invader to keep the motherland from rising again with daily terror bombings targeting civilian buildings has destroyed the homes of millions of Russians, often with their loved ones still inside. The destruction wrought by the enemy has forced these souls to roam the backwoods and search for shelter from the terrors of Russian wastes. In many areas, the horrors of banditry were not so different from the horrors of war, and hundreds of these wanderers from the wastes arrived daily looking for the protection of the guard. Many of these refugees are willing to enlist in our militias. In exchange for the chance of owning a home, perhaps the militia's training program could be enhanced with a section dedicated to building the houses with the recruits will live in. Orenburg declines her offer. The ambassador we sent to the peasants' communes of Orenburg to negotiate a treaty of mutual cooperation is returned. His message bears bad news, and he brought back a letter to us, stating Orenburg's response. As a proud and anarcho socialist nation, we will not sacrifice on our noble ideals and begin collaborating with a capitalist state. We have enough to hold our old ground against the fascists and Marxists that lie near us. We hope that we will stand together in face of these threats, but we refuse to work with your privatized industries. It seems as if Orenburg's stubbornness will be their downfall. Still, we must not let phase us. We'll continue fighting against the threats that challenge our very existence, whether solitary or not. The defense of the motherland, the liberation of all people, must remain our final goal. If not, then what is there to live for? We must find new partners, and I guess we can try to go ahead and train or watch our troops. Concerns over our proposals to even help the Orenburg communes are not entirely uncommon and have been justified upon the grounds that the settlements they have their own militias to fend off any aggressors and therefore don't need our objectively more disciplined troops. Some within the communes fear our influence and believe that the militias who are protecting their lands are more effective and less politically dangerous. To bypass this hiccup, we'll launch clandestine yet non-aggressive operations near their territory or to see what their defensive capabilities are or whether they even notice their movements at all. Gathering this intel should be a simple job for the guards. With this information, we can enter negotiations with Orenburg from a position of strength and possibly even silence opposition to cooperating with us. Some of our officers have stated that this strategic significance of such a move, as it can help or train our soldiers or troops for more missions of this kind if we are to challenge this mysterious Lysenko or scout out Dovanga's bandits. Good friends, for decades, Russians have always been used to sleeping with one eye open from the horrors of the First Great War, the chaos of the revolution, to the Iron abomination that was the occupation of our soil by Ger the German invader. You never knew who you could trust. The Euro Guard is a place where a Russian can find trust. One can sleep without worrying about being robbed, turn his back without worrying about being killed, and rely on his fellow man without being betrayed. The Guard is a tight-knit family made of men and women who have lost theirs. The Guard doesn't care for medals, honors, or fame. The Guard is a family and they want to only protect their land and people. Whenever a Guard fail falls in battle, his comrades feel like they've lost a dear brother. Which is pretty good for all the be benefits we get, so... Healthy rations. A pillar of gray smoke rises from the militia's encampment, touching the blue sky. Upon approaching the mass, the mess tent, easily looking on the count of the g crowd gathered around it, one can smell the reason why many Russians are joining the Euro Guard. The taste of a warm plate of stroganoff and onions. A good meal is in high demand across Russia, with famine being commonplace in motherland over, and have many have resorted to subsisting on canned goods, or at least food. Some of these tin monstrosities are more than ten years past expiration date. Though through local farmers, who have agreed to seed some of their livestock and with the labor of the refugees have provided in the orchards and gardens. The Euro Guard will be able to provide their men with tasty and healthy food. Besides supplying soldiers with the necessary nutrients for long periods of time, quality rations could cause a considerable boost in morale and attract dozens of refugees to the militia recruiting stations. Not bad. 
and a purpose in life. Every day, numerous fighting age men arrive on our doorstep looking for protection, fleeing from the horrors that stalk the hinterland. Now roaming our lands, most of them without friends, family, or loved ones, and above all, without a place in the world. These men are young and courageous, welcome additions to the militia. These nobodies. Men living a barren life without anyone caring for them. Tired of not doing anything. will find their purpose in a life on patrol. Joined by 13 other comrades and led by an experienced corporal, they will march towards the front lines to fight against the loathsome foe. It's good for even more war sport. 10% more is Reginald modeling. Good job, Reginald. I wish we could get more than 800, but makes sense why we're stuck there. So uh, Right now, we're just kind of hanging out, having a good old time. I want to raid them again so bad. Oh, they got more manpower. Oh, Alenda. I like the Chile, huh? And over here, they have nothing. Orenberg has a ton of manpower, but then again, they don't have a lot there to begin with anyways. Ah, uh, Barba. What a dude. What a fella. Militia system, no point doing that. So, refugees resettled. We can do it again once we get enough political power, but we'll see. We got some healthy rations. I just want to get stand for something greater just because that is such that is super strong for us. Extra population, war support, division, defensive core territory. There's a cry coming from the ends from the south, don't you hear it? That's a cry of the maniac Dolvanga. He cries for the profits of his war band and is arming for an unforeseen raid. His brigade is ready for aggression against the peaceful villages of the Urals. No more are we are defenseless farmers. Now the new Ural Guard is formed, reinforced by the people and fighting side by side with the sons of Rakuta. Along with we we have those heroes, all of our lands will be defended, and anywhere that is peaceful will be kept that way. Workers, peasants, grasp pure weapons, wear the uniform, we have a sacred duty. So that before the animals commit their crimes, the people in the militia will annihilate the fascist bandit army and set every one of them ablaze. Nice. Good train the militias, but whatever. Eh, yeah, that's not bad. Not bad. And ooh. Of course, then again, we did make these guys, what, like, 16 combos, so they don't have everything yet. They're doing pretty well on artillery. I'm thinking we'll make, might, might make these guys, like, 19 combos, they really inflict a lot of casualties on these people. So, we'll see. But we actually have a little bit of manpower now, which is pretty nice. Uh, maybe, maybe make them 20 combos, but then again, we have no anti-tank, so, or very little of it, at the very least. Uh, that's not bad. Logistics, efficiency, I mean, we don't, honestly, we need... Any more for right now, so raise the issue. An evaluation of the situation in Orenburg, especially regarding military and security matters, we found the previous arguments support opposition of our limited intervention rather lacking. How, we, however, cannot simply state how pathetic the current defensive capabilities are without raising some boring political concerns with the council and losing the diplomatic ground we've painstakingly built. It's been decided that we should give our evaluation a mild makeover, propping up certain weak elements whilst not shifting away from argument that the communists require support. One of the officers had the genuine idea to implement into the report. Uh, to the report to the council, the idea that Orenburg had built a good military foundation, where their help could truly reach their own potential. In this way, we may be able to overcome arguments that warrant of our influence, and finally begin helping the communes help themselves. Nice. All right, keep getting that artillery. There's lots of shells, man. Shell, 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 shell. Honestly, we're not mobilizing anymore, which kind of sucks. But we could keep doing that. Actually, what are we at? Um, three, five and a half percent. It's not bad. We're gonna mobilize quite a bit more, so. Uh, raise the issue. Why not? Might as well. Oh, uh, look at us when we speak. We need to stand together. Let's do that one first. Our tireless scouts have finally picked up the dreaded warning signs we'd hoped we would never come. Or what would never come. After checking and double checking directions of nearby targets, we've confirmed that the pillaging war host of the Black Band is finally marching toward Devourer Orenburg. As likely, the SS Renegades will smash through our defenses in the onset or outset of the rape of the communes. Neither we nor the woefully unprepared our anarchists could hope to withstand Drovanga's forces on our own. The aggressive fighting spirit and sheer brutality of the SS will overwhelm our limited forces if we decide to stand on our own. We need Orenburg with its manpower and wealth, just as they need us for our military expertise. A duel could be forged between our two factions, a bond of protection that might just secure our future. Nice. I'm tempted to do this one again. That's not bad for us. Like, it's really not bad. 65, huh? That's more than a year, so. Getting extra manpower is going to be super beneficial, so. Might as well. Not like we're going to be able to build this up. I just don't want to waste any more army XP, but then again, we could max it out. Increase the number of initiates. Hmm. And I'm about to go full 800. Screw it. Why not? Gotta stand together, man. How hard? How fast? Russian life is a series of nesting dolls. There's a palpable tension in the cramped room where the leaders of the Euro League are sitting hidden in their own polished hollows. There is angry quarreling and the occasional scuffle over, uh, but one common word tossed about inside that enormous doll like a ball of flame. Orenburg. Orenburg, Orenburg. The name bounces around the carved halls, daring someone, anyone, to pick it up and play with it. It's the main issue of the day. Having seen the broken communes as a vague nuisance still in the need of protection, the Euro League is unaccustomed to dealing with them as a diplomatic equal. 
With hostile knocking at the gates, however, it's clear that the custom area is no longer enough for the safety of the Southern Urals. A decision must be made. A faction of the generals proposed a direct approach. Overwhelming both will make the communes bow to our will. Demands of brashness could guarantee successful annexation. Another faction proposes a general seduction rather than a violent ravishing, a dance of alliances and mutual guarantees that will surely work better than a use of aggression. Those who are of, a, uh, of the diplomatic corps in the league hold a stance. Yet another corner of the Bruin proposes an innovative and exciting method, infiltrate and slowly turn their government towards the League's with its military and governmental assistance. Here are gathered the intelligence apparatus of the League, all with its dark secrets and hidden skeletons. Everyone else fears them, but no one can deny the proposal has merit. The debate staggers on early under the hours of the morning. Tired of stalemates and letting the census arguing continue, the contemplating men sat seated at the head of the table, gutters out of pain and sigh. Of course, it always comes down to this. The priest helmsman, the peacemaker, and kingmaker. It takes a breath, and the minister forward, and is settled. Mendrix has spoken, the debate's over, the early moves at dawn, forces our language. You need your strength? Subversion. Let's try subversion. That sounds like fun. Look at us when we speak. The perpetual cease of squabbling in the Orenburg Council is beginning to seriously hinder progress and our mission to secure the commons against outside threats to their prosperity and survival. We have the evidence from clandestine operations that we can show to the anarchists about their woefully unprepared defenses against any real threat opposed to their existence. Yep. Despite our warnings, the slow unrelenting arrow of time is marching onwards towards their doom, with each tick uh, getting closer to the event horizon whilst the council is still fighting amongst itself. Unless we begin to take the threat seriously and listen to our uh, vital, vital advice, we may have to force them to pay attention. Let's just certainly go against our moral code, but in this age of noble losers and dirty winners, we might have a chance, or uh, have to change some of our means to reach an end that will protect the region. Nice. Cool, cool, cool. An arrangement for our survival. The cursed, abominable bandits are finally amassing on the outskirts of both ours and Orenburg's frontier. The sun's clear. The former Nazis are on the warpath. The plunder and rape of our lands is all but guaranteed if drastic measures are not taken now. Dovanga's horde will likely crush both of our individual armies, despite our troops' quality, and Orenburg's, of course, <laughs> wealth. The only way we will stand a chance of survival is through uniting our forces, still under two banners, but with a single purpose. If the colonies do not accept our offer now, we have to. We will have to make our last stand alone. Train and train cooperate. Cooperate to train cooperate with Orenburg. That sounds very weird. Train cooperatively. Train together? I need to play as Austin too. Hold on. Before we keep going on. Hello. Okay, yeah, they definitely do. Ooh. National Socialism. Kinda cool. We'll see what happens though. Look at that man bar. Oh my goodness. Ooh. I'm getting excited. Ooh. Oh, hello. Well, there we go. This is why I got all the other military ones first before anything else happened. Hunters and Trappers. This one's. Hey, Mr. Mormon Moneybags. Welcome aboard. Logistics. Arm XP is nice and all, but, you know, look at us when we speak. The air inside the room crackled with expectation as the unimposing yet strangely captivating man of God surveyed his best and trusted commanders. It was almost common knowledge, except for a few unassuming lower rank officers, what the Latvian priests would ask of his men. The different factions within the military leadership had already been poring over statistics while brooding on their meaning. They would need the best arguments to convince the pious yet pragmatic man they followed, with a careful, cons with a careful considered voice of a practice certain orator. Mendrix addressed his trusted retinue of grizzled veterans, many of whom had forged an unbreakable bond with the priests from the time of the Long March. It was now time to address the question of Orenburg and its surrounding settlements, and fiercely anarchist commons, which, despite their distaste for a more centralized state structure, wished for nothing more than peace in their little part of the Ural steppes. The commons, however, had managed to develop a large industrial base, perhaps more than what's necessary for Orenburg's survival in this bleak part of the world. As Mendrix recounted this with his usual charismatic eloquence, he noticed that the ensuing discussion on how to best treat Orenburg, whether to follow the guard's mission to secure the helpless or use its overwhelming military force to serve authority of the area, and use its resources to expand the guard's power base was likely going to be a close one to call. Now, not everyone here had suffered the soul-crushing oppressive destruction that the gulags had forced onto the original members of the League. These people did not understand how power corrupts a man's humanity itself, warping it into a manifestation of its worst sins. Mendrix finished and began to call for the opinions of its commanders. He resigned himself from the moral dilemma and waited for the decision. Through fear and might, we, do we secure future? We cannot betray our origins. Collaboration for freedom? Uh, they want to destroy the League. The Euro League. Which is not good, especially if uh, these guys join in with them. Um, oh, crap. Let's let the... Is it both of them? I don't remember this one. Let's let the Warlord decision target... Or, ooh. Ooh. I hope they go with that one. Because if we have to defend here... I mean, we still have mounts. We have one, two, three, four, five... Five. Ew. Oh, that's not good. That is really not good. If that's the case, we got enough artillery, hopefully, here that we can just throw on at least make these guys 19 combo with. Because if we can shell the living crap out of the, enough of them, they won't be able to kill us too much, so. Yeah, we've, like, got literally no support equipment. We can get some anti-tank, but we don't have any extra anti-tank. God dang it. Uh, get some more defense. Oh, I'm wrecking such crappy rifles. I should have upgraded them long ago. Please let you guys go with the other group. I might have to do some funky stuff to make sure we actually live. 
Oh boy. Oh boy. I mean, defense-wise, it would be okay, but... Orenburg, please, for the love of God, do something. I mean, if it's 1v1, we'll do okay. Hopefully. But... Uh, let's see, steroids. Oh, steroids. Rage-inducing hormones. I got a lot of attack, but we got a lot of defense. Alright, so they're going to war with us. Now, one step back. Uskatov is in downtown these days. The guardsmen composing his main demographic have moved to other more intense activities. No matter how much more its proud leaders refuse to admit it, how fewer of them are coming back than they care to admit. Far, far fewer. Many of them die in the hills that many are already calling the meat grinders, against a foe whose, whose ranks never thin out as much as the league would like. There is another name for those blood-soaked hills, one that is more popular by far, the mistakes. And who can blame the public for latching on? In quiet desperation, the leaders made a windswept, nameless part of the city. The main complex is already costed by multiple demonstrations of the few remaining citizens still present and discussed plans. They circled around the normal plans, further mobilization reserves, exploitation of advanced weaponry, the usage of regiments still in basic training. All are soundly rejected, as everyone anticipates, after all. These solutions don't serve an inherent purpose. No, their sole purpose is to guide our elected council, and by way of trial and error, to a single disconcerting conclusion. Mendrix breaks the deadlock as usual. Reportedly snapping his advisors to stop a wasting of time in the lives of the soldiers before authorizing a formal request to Ornberg. The League prepares to assume the position most despises, the position of pleading. Ornberg must save them, who would? Send the request. We will stand alone. Uh, that's why I saved right now, not one step back. I didn't do anything, I sort of refugees. Could we attack? Because they do have less defense. And do okay here. Before. Maybe. Maybe. Could we do this too? All right. Well. Um. You know what? I hope these guys kill us then. United together, the potents or portents are grim, and the mad hordes of Dovang and last single gathering around the horizon, ready to feast. Or that is the impression gained from the studying the preparation of the Euro League and the militias of Ormberg. Guardsmen and militiamen coordinate, cut flawless in their exercises, finally starting to work together as a unified power against the forces of darkness to the east. However, this arrangement needs to be formalized so that the bonds of the two social societies share shall be cast in ink as well as blood and seal. The Southern Euro United Defense League, a formal pact that shall cement a commitment to mutual defense and the immutable bonds of bureaucracy. Finally, as the soldiers have been united, our politicians and diplomats shall be as well. Let them come. Let the dogs of war crash against the fortifications like waves in the ocean. They will find us un as unbroken, standing hand in hand against both the icy soullessness of Magna Githorsk and the warm bloody viciousness of Dovanger. We've already won. So, go kill yourself, Orenberg. Bring it on. I want to kill off Ornberg now. Break the Black Mountain? Yeah. Get us more refugees. Seek assistance. It's not that we often uh, seek for, ask for assistance from our neighbors, considering their eccentric takes on diplomacy, economy, economics, and rational governance theory, but the towns come to acknowledge that we cannot stand alone. And of our neighbors, the communes are the sanest by far compared to the murderous banditry of the Dovanga Brigade and the terror of the Black Mountain. If we must lean on anyone else, the communes are a safe bet, even with all their bizarre talk of radical abolishment of hierarchies and their inability to cooperate in anything. And both of us have bigger enemies to deal with, the best reason for friendship there can be. Formalities are being settled. An escort is being drafted from ranks and a rough request is taking shape. Our leaders agree that food and manpower are critical priorities. The question is which we will ask for. Food could help us boost our productivity and improve our existing resources and stockpiles for future activities, whilst manpower would help us fill our ranks and boost our military capabilities. Mendrix and his advisors plan into the night, and it's decided. We shall focus on conquest of bread. Bread. I like bread. Send them. Honestly, I don't want to send them anything now. Like, they're a bunch of crappers. Like, I want to kill them off. Um... To get to the gun. We, like the cursed Prussian ancestors of the Nazi beasts that conquered our motherland, are an army of the state. With this comes certain focus on a specific area of industry, as their goals are also heavily militaristic. Firearms. Orenburg is a little different, however. Their military stockpile is rather pathetic compared to ours. Not really a massive surprise, considering their lack of centralized direction and economic priorities. You know the dangers that settling in this region possess, uh, or possesses. A military mindset is strongly required one like ours. We should, therefore, in a continued effort towards securing Orenburg, give them... Give some of them our spare firearms. They will be able to equip their own troops, but will have also blueprints to build their own guns with a considerable industrial base. And even though we're doing all this stuff, we're not going to help them out. The colonies have agreed that in the face of the ever-growing threat to their well-being and survival, they need our military support and grant them security. We should therefore make best use of both our military, better military, and tactical and operational knowledge, whilst also utilizing Orenberg's large manpower pool by sending the anarchists, some of, the more, some of our more seasoned officers. Ornberg will likely also be raising more troops now that they finally realize what is at stake. By training the current troops and officers, we can certainly influence the direction of the whole communal army towards the standard that we deem acceptable. They have not collapsed on anarchy. Not yet. Give them time. Nice. Oh, a light 
for gritted teeth. It's unfortunate that we have the displeasure of having a request rejected in full by the league. We have had no success. Metrix assures the league that he has no intention of letting Us Katov starve. We're continuing to search for aid from other regions, and all assistance should stay positive. The officer's words betray no trace of what he really feels. Who can believe them? Where else is there to go? The Euro League simply doesn't have anyone to rely on, and if this failed deal sets the pace for the change in relations, then terrible things await both Ormberg and the guard, and the neighbors watch with hunger and plot. He feels sick to his stomach. He might not uh, admit it to himself, but he's lost. And today, most of Ustkatov feels the same. He prepares himself to meet an anxious wife and child who no doubt welcome him back, but with a touch of unease, even disappointment. He wonders if he, he, will, he, will, he will be able to live with the guilt. It's the most suboptimal situation. What do you mean? I'll break Black Mountain. I'll beat the crap out of them. Do they have three? When I played them, they had three divisions. Oh, they're talking to Orenburg. Well, they went the right way. They should have three divisions, not two. They should have three. Three. Tres. Dry. Three. Un, deux, trois. Without trois. I don't know. I don't speak French anymore. They're selling ref refugee arenas. It's fine. Gift of the gun. Many helping hands? I mean, we don't even use that at all. Yeah, uh, let's force the attack. Uh, let's do it. Makeshift bridges and force the attack. That should definitely help us out. Yep, oh, see, there's the third division. There you go. Help him out. We're actually doing... I mean, after we conquered Dovanga's brigade, look at that. Not bad. Alright, I'm going to kill all these guys. These guys suck hard. I hate these guys so much. Send weapons to Ornberg? Heck no. I'm going to kill them off. Um, honestly, I don't know what else we can do here. Teach oh, a sermon. Doubtless you've heard of the defeat of the Hitlerite bandits in the south and the de death of the Drollbanger. Now the Black Mountain, so long feared and ominous by the peoples of the Northern Urals, is being scaled by our men at this moment. I will not use this opportunity to lecture you on the superiority of our forces on how we are un un unbeatable like some might. Rather, I want to tell you about the times when we were there without hope and filled with fear. One might wonder why I tell you about the th times of hardship and suffering we had to endure right now. Surely we should be given thanks for our victory. While we were in Vorkuta, one would hardly see any reason to thank God then, but we stuck together and pers persevered. On the march, many fell by the wayside. No one would be blamed for doubting the journey we took, but we still pressed on. Even when the menace to the east threatened to overwhelm us and destroy all we held dear, we kept going. Why? At every step, from the gulag to the march, to the battlefields of the southern Euros, we believed in a final victory. That God would help us no matter how dire the circumstances were. He was with us when we starved. He was with us when we mourned our fallen. He is just as, at, as with us at our moment of victory. I want you to remember this moment of joy and triumph, but I want you to remember the moment of sadness and hardship as well. For when sadness and hardship visit you again, you know that through your will and your faith in our Lord, that you will surely triumph just once again. Amen. The pilgrimage. Sometime after the defeat of the League's enemies, several senior officers took note of the large fleet of trucks they had taken from Las Cinco's NKVD and Dovanga's brigade at first. The joke and remarked that these would have been very useful in the long march from Brokuta all those years ago, but the joke slowly evolved into a genuine idea, and soon there was talk of a pilgrimage back to where it all began. A small cadre of soldiers formed to make the journey and drove north, retracting the route they'd taken before, albeit much better equipped this time, despite a few run-ins with brigands. Within a fortnight, they reached the frigid outskirts of the Brokuta Gulag. They camp, their camp sat empty, practically untouched since they had left it. They spent several days there, reflecting on how far they had come, leaving memorials for those who were not allowed to make this pilgrimage, hunting for anything they might have left behind. For one soldier, however, the beginning would also be his end. For all the victory, for all the memories, his heart ran empty. He rubbed the stump of his arm where one of Dorvanga's men had hacked it off and thought of it all. The comrades he had lost in the labyrinthine halls of Las Ankles Lab. Sitting in his old cell, he thought of all the men who had been imprisoned alongside here, none of whom now remained. He wept bitterly as he qu questioned why he alone was here, if not only to suffer. The uh, answer was suddenly clear in his mind. His comrades found him on the floor in the cell, pistol in his hand, his cheek wet with tears. They suddenly buried him in the camp's small graveyard. His cross, the only standing one amidst the dozens of graves ravaged by the years before setting the corpses, setting, setting their course for home. Some souls knew, never truly left for Kuda. Teach uh, their artisans. Orenburg's comments have produced wealth that would have seemed impossible at the dawn of Soviet collapse, however. The common's industrial methods are far too disorganized to properly make use of the base they possess. If our industrial officers were to give advice to the communist artisans and industrialists, we could hopefully educate the anarchists on modern industrial techniques. With this arrangement in place, we may be able to further improve ties between the two factions, at the same time becoming better prepared for... foreign invasion. Um, yeah, I'm not sending them jack squad. They don't deserve it. If anything, I'll... Can we kill them off, please? They rejected us so many times. I have no patience for these pieces of garbage. And yeah, at this point, I was just training. It doesn't matter at this point. So, actually, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Because we have we got a lot of artillery. We are looking pretty gosh darn awesome right now. Yeah, I should have not spent that. Oh, well, whatever. Um, and the South African Civil War. Oh, what happened down there? Did someone use chemical weapons? Occupied territories. Uh, use those guys. There you go. Oh, well. That is awkward. You survived, South Africa, but... 
Not really. I think Selma did. Take the volunteers. One of our guard commanders was recently presented a brilliant idea to further our military capabilities and in turn help secure the Orenburg communes. If the council cannot push for the standardization of the military, we should recruit any volunteers from the communes that desire to join our honorable and effective guards. In this way, we can assure that Orenburg's larger manpower pool is best put to use. As our expert military training has proven our ability as a fighting force over the communes' weaker militia units now, we just need to produce the correct propaganda to influence anarchists. Our expectations are quite high as many of the anarchists are beginning to see the wolves scratching at their door. Nice. Ooh, can get some more stuff here? Of course, we have some more Warlord development, but we'll see what happens. 15 million is not great, but not bad. Elevate the Gifted. With the Orenburg recruitment campaign having been a success, we are in the process of sending the new recruits through our rigorous training scheme. These men will become proud members of our prestigious guard, ready for the momentous trials ahead of them. In an effort to make the few new forces operationally ready, we'll have to further train certain individuals who have shown greater motivation and talent for soldiering during basic training. These will become new com newly commissioned and non-commissioned officers for active field duty, fighting for the survival of the people in the homeland. Not bad. I want to get to each one first. Is there an Orenberg, some instructors? No. They're worthless. 800, 800, not bad. Oh, Israel's here too. Look at that. State of Israel. Um, yeah. Honestly, I'm not sure what if there's anything else here. Uh, so, yeah. So, I'm, I'm going to assume that there's nothing else here. So, we'll go through all these focuses as best we can. And I'll probably just go to war with the Orenberg. Like, seriously. Oh, there goes the manpower. Um, 800, uh, anything else here? Resettle refugees? Might as well, I guess. There's Pakistan. But arm them all. The many recruits from the Orenburg Commons have now owned a standardized training regiment, preparing them for challenges and the likely terrors to come. A few have arrived with weapons from the farms and former army equipment from a war they would likely rather forget. This must be changed immediately. We will begin to equip all of our trained soldiers with a set of standardized equipment. Specialized groups such as mortar and machine gun teams will receive extra training to accompany their unique battlefield roles. Most of our recruits should be should use our standardized rifle, a tool that's not been let that's not let our man down, and certainly will not be any different for the anarchist recruits. Cool. A little bit ahead of town. Get some better guns. Guns are good. Guns are yummy. Guns are tasty. Guns make you feel mm mm mm. Damn. You gotta teach mediocre after we arm them all. Or maybe we'll arm them all and then teach mediocre. An army corps does not require effective soldiers ready to die for the cause and efficient officers leading them to victory. To function in a manner where the victories can be best capitalized upon or worse, the losses minimized to an extent where further operations are still possible. A military force needs support staff. Such staff must be expertly trained in matters such as communication, repair, medicine, and countless other tasks, but not necessarily excellent warriors. We'll have to fill these roles to the new guard units we are building from the Orenburg recruits. It's been decided that supervising officers should weed out those who may have better use somewhere away from the frontline operations. Willing volunteer divisions from Orville join our army, huh? We're out of manpower, huh? Lower training standards? Nah, we good, man. We good. Friendship and labor? Um... Over the past few months, we've grown closer to the distressful Orenburg Commons, though their anarchist ways did not always mesh well with our more ordered and efficient state. However, in the face of encroaching danger on the little paradise of the Commons of Belt, relations have shifted for the better. The once stubborn council has taken advice on multiple issues and sees a need for close cooperation. It's now the best time to take things to the next stage and propose an alliance with the anarchists. If not, then perhaps they would allow us to help protect them in cases of emergency. Either way, our two separate nations will become closer, and cooperation and industry and trade could be also expanded. Study history. The secret of survival is learning from the mistakes of others. Most of the challenges the Euro League is facing in the most moment have been overcome before by others in history. Studying their experiences can give us valuable insights on how to conduct our operations. Great Patriotic War should provide the most valuable information to our commanders as both Dovanger's SS and Lysenko's NKVD Motor Rifle Division played a part in that conflict. With both extensive documentation and a large number of Russian war veterans surrounding the Colonel Staranov as advisors, we have means to provide sufficient information to teach advise officers valuable lessons. At this point, we're just going to go and do a loud diplo. Because I want to kill them off. Because they kept rejecting us. Go die in a hole. Oh. Oh, we got the... Oh, they came over here. Cool. Thanks. Bye. We don't want you here anymore. Uh, go in. Kill yourself, Orenberg. Seriously, just kill yourself. Uh, so the logistics. There was a saying in the old Mikhail Frun's military academy, amateur study tactics while professional study logistics. Even with all the valor our guard possesses, it's impossible for them to defeat our enemies without the proper equipment. Given the immense importance of keeping our troops at the front line well supplied, a specialized logistics and transport corps will be established and staffed by our most organized officers. We cannot tolerate the possibility of the guard facing the enemy's wrath lacking in the tools for victory. Nice. Hunters and trappers? Uh, the wilderness does not belong to the strongest, but to the sober. 
skilled, resilient, and above all to those who possess the strongest wills. In these dire times, countless men are taken to the woods to guarantee their family's survival. Some did so out of nece uh, necessity recently, while others have been doing it for generations. When informed of the grave danger they're now facing, these hard men will surely take up arms along our guard to ensure their survival. Hunters and trappers will provide themselves to be a welcome addition to our efforts. With the knowledge of the hinterlands and capacity to uh, operate autonomously for long periods, they could be the perfect fit for our long-range scouts. They could even be grouped with some of our more experienced guards, or so immense terror in the enemy's deep rear guard, ensuring the most important targets, laying traps for the troops, and then vanishing through the woods without a trace. And caravan experience. Even after the Soviet Union collapsed under German arms, and with most of its territory being under the threat of the terror bombings committed by the loop office, trade still flourished. Dozens of coal houses, villages, and even small cities kept producing. Farmers kept working in their fields and workers in their factories. Every kind of good was in high demand, from essentials such as food and medicine to alcohol and pornography to ease the pain of living. Facing bandits, animals, warlords, the weather, and the ever present threat of the loop office, these groups of few souls brave enough to handle trade are called caravans. They could prove themselves to be a valuable addition to our forces for their ability to keep distant uh, posts supplied, even under overwhelming adversity, is second to none. A comprehensible logistics plan based on the caravans will assure our troops in the front lines don't lack anything. And at this point, we're just going to do focus autocomplete because we're done. Because that's the end of the focus tree, which is a little disappointing that I wish we had a little bit more here, but you know. It's alright. Things happen. And we've got plenty of map power. We're looking pretty good. Your league is pr looking pretty darn awesome. But like, what happened, I think, when I played as Magnitogorsk? There's really no end to this. It's just, this is what it is, and there's pretty much nothing more. But hey, this was a lot more fun than I thought it would be. I thought we were going to be, like, getting destroyed immediately as soon as we try to fight Dovanga. But, obviously, we did surprisingly really well. But, hey, if you enjoyed the campaign, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And let me know what you thought of the campaign and who else I should play as in the future. Thanks for watching. Have a great, 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 great rest of your day.